Uh, Elohim is a uh, is a plural word. Uh, Elohim. Uh, when you have Hebrew words that end in that I am, you know it's plural. This is what's known as a plural of majesty that gives honor to God. Doesn't mean that there are gods. Now, sometimes it talks of the gods of the nations, and it uses the word Elohim, and in those situations, they are uh, in the plural. But in, in when it's referring to God of the Bible and uses the word Elohim, the adjectives that uh, modify Elohim are always in the singular and not in the plural. And whenever you have verbs uh, that go along with the word Elohim, they are in the singular and not in the plural. So even though it's a plural word, uh, it is a plural of majesty. And there is, of course, the idea of one God. And I, I, I thought that was an interesting thing. Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Lord, that is Yahweh, the God of Israel, is called our Elohim and declared to be one. And so uh, that's a lot of that. Uh, I'm a monotheist, not a polytheist. A polytheist is a pagan who believes in many gods. I'm a monotheist, one God. And uh, Judaism, uh, Christianity, and Islam are the only monotheistic uh, religions, major religions that uh, we have. The others uh, are not. Buddhism is more of a philosophy than it is a, a something that's theological. Hinduism believes in lots and lots of gods. And so uh, uh, those are some things that are valuable. Uh, there was a section in 28 about the difference between the Hebrew word made and the word created. And uh, it goes back and forth between the two. Um, it forms kind of a pattern and draws special attention to things. I thought that was kind of interesting uh, that man was created or made. He uses that, but he also uses the word created for them. Uh, the idea of let there be light. Uh, the worship of the sun and the moon as major deities in the ancient Near East and Egypt. In fact, when you look at the history of Egypt, you have the difference between the sun god, their history is the sun god and the moon god. And the two are fighting with each other. And when the sun god is in there, then they erase all the moon god stuff. And then when the moon god uh, is the one in power, they erase all the sun god stuff. But uh, uh, these, are, uh, these are things that God made. They are not gods themselves. And, of course, you have that kind of thing. Genesis not wanting to suggest that God created the sun god and the moon god used instead the greater light and the lesser light to refer to them. I think that's an interesting thing. Um, Jesus' view of creation Skip down to the second uh, paragraph. Jesus regarded the Old Testament's historicity as impeccable, accurate, and reliable. He often chose for illustrations in his teaching the very persons and events that are the least acceptable today to critical scholars. This can be seen from his reference to Adam, to Abel, to Noah, to Abraham, to Lot, and Sodom and Gomorrah. If Sodom and Gomorrah were fictional accounts, then how could they serve as a warning for future judgment? This also applies to Jesus' understanding of Jonah. Uh, Jonah was not the best example of a prophet that we ever had. He was very reluctant. Jesus did not see Jonah as a myth or a legend. The meaning of the passage would lose its force if it were. How could Jesus' death and resurrection serve as a sign if the events of Jonah did not take place? Furthermore, Jesus says that the men of Nineveh will stand at the last judgment because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. But if the account of Jonah is a myth or symbolic, then how can the men of Nineveh stand at the last judgment? 
let me mention this, and, and I, this is something that has helped me. There are a little over 30 examples of Jesus referring to events in the Old Testament. Never does Jesus ever treat those events of the Old Testament as some kind of a myth or a fairy tale or just a story. I don't like using the word story a lot of times for those things that are of the Old Testament. A narrative might be a better word, but sometimes when people think of a story, they think of something that could be fictional. And I don't want them to think of the Bible stories as fictional. I want them to see them as real events, that the story that is being told is about something real, <clears throat> not about something that just appeared uh, to somebody or, or somebody dreamed up. And I think this is an important thing for, for that. But I, I wanted to just kind of point that out about uh, the way that he does that. Uh, I think about how that he made male and female. We're living in time of transgender people. And if we talk about sex, there is male and there's female. Oh, I know there's some aberrations sometimes whenever you have a little mixture of that uh, physically. Uh, very rare, but it's there. Doesn't mean they're not either major, major male or, or that. It just means that they have genitalia or something that's mixed up. Uh, every every uh, cell in your body has a molecule that determines whether or not you're XX or XY. And uh, uh, it is biological. And from the Bible standpoint, you have male and female. This idea that there are 50-some genders was made up by psychologists only in the last 20 years or so. It's not something that has been thought for a long, long time. And unfortunately, it's created a tremendous amount of confusion. And of course, it's, it's a situation where all of a sudden uh, this group who are confused as to who they are uh, is, is really a problem. It is amazing how many times they'll talk about people who have transgendered, but they will not tell you how many people who transgendered and then went back. They stopped. Nor do they tell you how many of the people who have transgendered who commit suicide. And the number of people who have done that, that number goes up way, way high compared to other people. These are people who are of a frame of mind that is very difficult. But to try to, to change the whole world because of these confused folks, and I, want to, I don't want to call them perverted, I want to call them confused, at least be kind to them a little bit, uh, to try to change the whole world because of this psychological confusion among these folks is ridiculous. And it's confusing to young people. One of the big problems that we've had today is that a lot of mamas and daddies have children who uh, they, the parent kind of imposes on the child that they can't tell what, what, uh, what gender they are. And so they grow up wondering because and a lot of it is the parent who creates the problem. And uh, that's an unfortunate thing. An unfortunate thing. Uh, we talked about Jesus in the age of the universe already last night. I do want to mention about being created in the image of God. I think that's important. Page 30. Uh, I've talked about how that God is the father of spirits. You have an earthly father, an earthly mother, but the spirit inside of you came from God. He's the one who gave us our spirit. And so there is a, a bit of the divine in every person. That spirit came from God. Uh, William Grasham, uh, who wrote the commentary on Genesis for Truth for Today, that came out of Circe with uh, Eddie Clower and that group, uh, two volumes. But in the first volume, he talks about man made in the image of God, and he lists seven things. Uh, first, only man can think above himself and reason about his thoughts. You don't find animals doing that. Uh, we're going to move down quickly. Second, only man is able to learn from experience, to accumulate knowledge from others, 
and he can preserve that knowledge at the end of the paragraph in both oral and written forms so that his children and grandchildren don't have to discover everything new. Aren't you glad somebody figured out how to build a fire? Aren't you glad somebody figured out how to make a wheel? A lot of things. Uh, number three, only man has dominion or rule over the earth and all the animal kingdom. After everything is said and done, no matter how powerful the animal, the human being still is the one who can control what goes on there. Uh, fourth, only man shows restlessness with the physical things of life. And that's because Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11, God has set eternity in their heart. I think that's an important thing. There's something more about us than just what's on this earth. Number five, only man is a moral being with a sense of oughtness and having a conscience. Number six on the next page, the second paragraph down, only man has an aesthetic nature that allows him to produce art, music, and poetry. Uh, your your dog probably might like some music, might howl with it, but uh, writing music is not really in the dog's best interest. The aesthetic sense. Yeah, I, I mentioned these things, and they are so obvious, but it really does help us to understand the difference between being a man, a human being, and being an animal. And uh, the idea that somehow or another... <clears throat> we are just a higher form of animal uh, is just all of these differences uh, lose their ability. There just is no explanation for them. And number seven, only man has a concept of a future life beyond the grave that we will face uh, God one day. Okay. Let's, let's look now into Genesis chapter two. I just wanted to mention one or two things and, I felt like these were things that uh, deserved some mention. The Bible and the Sabbath. Uh, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their, their hosts. Uh, the hosts would be uh, angels and, and other things. All the things that had to, to come to do with, with that. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested. Now, the word rest is a, a note here means to cease or desist. It doesn't mean that he was tired, give out. You and I get tired and we give out, but that's not God. Uh, he s rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. And then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work, uh, which God had created and made. Um, the Sabbath day was commanded to Israel, and Israel alone, by the way. It was to keep the Sabbath for two reasons. Number one, because uh, after the sixth day of creation, God ceased from his labors. And the second reason is because Israel had been delivered from slavery in Egypt, Deuteronomy 5 and verse 15. Now, this is the reason why we do not keep the Sabbath day as Christians. It was never given to us. It was given to Israel because they had been rescued, they had been delivered from uh, slavery in Egypt. The covenant which included observance of the Sabbath was made with Israel only. Uh, Deuteronomy 5, verses 2 and 3 bring that out very clearly, that it was not to all the other nations. It was not even to people before that time. It was to Israel from the time of Moses onward. And so it was a sign between God and Israel, not a sign between God and all the nations. Now, I don't know about you, but I am a Gentile. I'm not a Jew. I'm a Gentile. The Sabbath was never given to Gentiles. It was given to Jews. Now, if you were a Gentile and you lived in the home of a Jew, uh, as a, maybe as a slave in the ancient times or whatever, you were expected to keep the Sabbath just as they were. But that was because you belonged to that household. But it was not true of anyone else. 
And I think it's very, very important. Number four, observance of the Sabbath was never commanded as part of a covenant with the fathers before the time Israel came out of Egypt. In fact, that's very, very clear from Deuteronomy 5. Let's look at that passage. I know some of you have been studying Deuteronomy, but that's, a, that's an important point. And um, I wanted you to see that. It says in verse, uh, Then Moses summoned all Israel, said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and ordinances which I am speaking today, in your hearing that you may learn them and observe them carefully. Mm, one of 27 times. Carefully. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, with all those of us alive here today. Then verse 15, six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant, your female servant, or your ox or your donkey or any of your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you so that uh, your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out of there by mighty hand and with an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Now, I've, I've gone to this a little bit because there are Sabbatarians in the world today. And this is a passage that they need to hear, be reminded of, that it was never given to Christians. It was given to Israel. Seventh day Adventists. They are Sabbatarians. Yeah, they are. Uh, the Seventh day Adventists and there are Seventh day Church of God. Uh, there are a few other little groups that do that, but usually Seventh day is part of the name. It is interesting that anytime I talk about the Lord's Day and talk about Sabbath day, uh, I get the worst hate mail. <laughs> Uh, they have been meaner to me than even those that don't believe that baptism is for the remission of sins. Uh, I get that every once in a while. But the Sabbatarians are mean. You know, they don't think I've ever read the Bible, that I don't know about the Ten Commandments or anything. And, of course, I, I send this stuff to them, and then they send it back to me without reading it. They, they're, not, they're not open-minded. And so uh, I get that. Uh, one other passage that I want you to look at about the Ten Commandments, and I think this is important. Exodus 34, verses 27 and 8. Uh, this is an interesting passage. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write down these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord 40 days, 40 nights. He didn't eat bread or drink water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, comma. What were they? The Ten Commandments. Now, when you're debating with somebody who is a Sabbatarian, uh, the thing that you don't, you don't want to talk about law, you want to talk about covenant. Because when you look at Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, and that's quoted in the book of Hebrews uh, 8, uh, beginning about verse 7 or 8, going down to about verse 12. It's there that God is going to make a new covenant that will be different from the old covenant that he made when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. What was that? Uh, Jeremiah 31, 30. Oh, are you talking about the Exodus? Yeah. Exodus 34, 27, 28. That's the most specific one that I know of that makes it very clear that, yes, the Ten Commandments were part of the covenant. But if you're debating with a Sabbatarian, you want to talk about covenant. You don't want to talk about the law of Moses. They want to say the law of Moses has this moral law that's always in place, and then there's the ceremonial law. Well, first of all, you don't have that distinction made in the Old Testament. You have the covenant, and that covenant includes all of it. And if you show that the covenant there was an old covenant and a new covenant, uh, then that does. The second chapter of the book written by Ed Wharton on the Church of Christ if I were going to teach another class, I would want to teach Ed Wharton's book, The Church of Christ. Maybe I'll do that next year. I don't know whether y'all teach one on the church or not. But uh, that is a book, especially the second chapter, which talks about the old and the new covenant. 
I feel like this is so important for us to see because the Sabbath is introduced here. And I wanted to spend a little time with this. Uh, and so the words of the covenant made with Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt was the Ten Commandments, the fourth of which demands observance of the Sabbath. Hebrews 4 and verse 4 distinguishes between physical rest and redemptive rest to which it pointed. Colossians 2.16 makes it clear that the Mosaic Sabbath has no symbolic or ritual place in the new covenant. The church began worshiping on the first day of the week to commemorate the resurrection. The day of Pentecost was on the first day of the week always. They met on the first day of the week in Acts 20 and verse 7. They gave on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16. There is the mention of the word Lord's Day. I don't know whether I have uh, talked about this before or not. But uh, the Lord's Day is only found one time in the New Testament. And that is in the book of Revelation chapter 1 verse 10. And where he says he was in the spirit on the Lord's Day. The phrase Lord's Day in Greek is the word kyriake hemera. Then you have in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 20, the phrase kyriakon dipnon, the Lord's Supper. The only time that word kyriake, which is an adjective in the feminine in Revelation, in the masculine, in, in 1 Corinthians, same word, and it's mas it actually neuter, not masculine, but it's the same word. And uh, it, the only time it appears is in those two passages. And the concept and the idea is there that you have the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day. Anybody who's studied uh, any of the writings of Everett Ferguson dealing with the Lord's Supper, he makes it very clear that the early church, based upon the writings of the early church fathers, only observe the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day. There, that's why whenever someone says, oh, you can have any day you want to, well, they didn't, they didn't understand that. Yes, Daniel. Sometimes, um, I guess maybe I've been guilty in the past of thinking of the Sabbath day like a day of worship like we do on Sundays or the Lord's Day. And it seems like the more I understand the Sabbath, it was a holy day, a day of rest. But they would have been in the temple every day sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then in the, when the synagogue would come around later, uh, you know, after, I guess, not the second year, day, uh, yeah. they would uh, be spending time in that. Um, what, what's your picture of what a Sabbath day uh, would look like for the Jews? Well, of course, because of the Pharisees, you had some traditions that would have governed some of that. And these are not biblical things. These are just the traditions that were human. There was the Sabbath day's journey, which would be about 2,000 feet, I think, if I'm not mistaken, which would be less than a mile. Uh, they would have, on the Sabbath day, traveled to the synagogue, but they would have a synagogue that would not be that far away from their home. And they would live close to it so that they, they would not be breaking the Sabbath day's journey. Uh, on that day, which would have started on Friday evening, because let's remember, the Jews worship by Jewish time. So they would have had on Friday the day of preparation. In fact, Luke and John mentioned the day of preparation, and that's talking about Fridays. The day of preparation, especially in the afternoon, would have been a time preparing their food and all of the other things for the Sabbath day. Uh, Ever, uh, Edersheim uh, wrote a book called Sketches of Jewish Social Life. If you really want a good study, and Logos has that, I think even in some of their basic pack, packages. If you really want to look at how they did that, I would recommend you look at Edersheim's Sketches of Jewish Social Life, and it would give you a lot of good information with regard to that. And many of these uh, laws that the Pharisees would have had, they had, believe it or not, 200 oral laws dealing with nothing but the Sabbath day. For instance, on the Sabbath day, 
when you put on your sandals, you made sure that they were laced with leather on the sole. There were some sandals in those days that had some iron nails that held the sole together. If you had one that had iron, the iron in them, that would be work, so you didn't wear those. You only wore the ones that had the leather. Uh, on uh, the Sabbath day, if you had a chicken and the chicken laid an egg on the Sabbath day, you could not eat that egg because that chicken worked. But you could sell it to a Gentile and he could, he could eat it. <laughs> if it were the Sabbath day and someone came to your home and they were begging for food or for money or something, the person who was the beggar could put their hand inside the door to take whatever you were to give to them. But you could not put your hand outside the door. Now, why? I don't know. If you were uh, in a home on the Sabbath day and you had a mirror, they would turn the mirror facing the wall so that you could not look in the mirror for fear that someone would go to that mirror and pluck a hair or something like that. These were the kinds of ridiculous laws that they had back in those days, and they were all human laws. They were not in Scripture. But uh, that's the kind of thing that would have been very, very common in the days of Jesus on the Sabbath day. They would, uh, they would go to the synagogue and worship because the temple would be probably too far away. Only people who lived around the temple could go there. Um, the synagogue was more than just a place of worship on, on the Sabbath day. It was a place where they would go and they would study. Uh, the two principal things that were done on the in the synagogue were uh, studying and prayer. Uh, Everett Ferguson makes the point. Uh, there were some who came out and said, oh, they didn't sing in the synagogue. And Ferguson said, no, they did. Well, I believe Ferguson. And yes, they did. So they sang psalms. Uh, by the way, the only place where there were instruments of music that were played in Jewish worship would be at the temple. The synagogues did not have those, did not have instruments of music. They sang. Uh, they would have sung. And so before the church ever began, singing unaccompanied, would have been something that would have been very, very common among Jewish people long before Christianity started. And so sometimes people get that mixed up. They would have known the Psalms. We don't have the tunes to the Psalms, but we have the words. And they would have had the words from early on. So that would have been something that they would have done. But the prayers, the reading of the scripture. Now, the book of Acts talks about what they would do on the Sabbath day, and you have Paul going into there. They would have the reading of the scripture. They would read from Moses, and then they would read from something else, either the prophets or the writings. Uh, but David is called a prophet, by the way, so even though his is among the writings, it would have been prophetic. But they would read one section, and they kept the scrolls of the Bible in a separate room. They would uh, keep them in jars sometimes and other things to make sure that they did not, but they, they would bring them out. Uh, when I was in um, Capernaum, uh, they had a, uh, an old torn down uh, synagogue there. And you this little room off to the side where they would have the scrolls and they would bring them out and they would read them. After they were read, and by the way, the people stood up whenever Scripture was being read, just as they did back during the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. They stood up, and then when the Scriptures, they had finished reading that assigned Scripture, they would sit down. And the preacher, if you'll notice, Jesus sat down before he preached the uh, Sermon on the Mount, and uh, Jesus sat down at the Capernaum synagogue after the reading had taken place. He sat down on Moses' seat. Now, the synagogues were probably not as big as this room, maybe half the size of this room. Uh, the Moses' seat would be uh, right next to the doorway coming in, and it would be raised up. 
the places where you would sit would be around the walls, all around the walls, and the children would sit on the floor. Uh, it could hold, the one that in Capernaum uh, could hold maybe 100 people, not much more than that, maybe 120, but not much more than that. Yes, sir. Okay, Psalm 150 has a number of those. Second Chronicles 29, verse 25, talks about how that uh, you have a prophet and a seer that had told to David, and Nathan also was involved in that, that he could use the instruments of music in the worship. But we do not have anything in the New Testament that talks about instrumental music being, being used in the uh, temple. This all comes out of the Old Testament. Yeah. Every instance where it talks about worship and music in the New Testament for Christians is always a cappella, always singing. Uh, there is no other, there is no command, there's no inference, there's no example, nothing except uh, singing. Okay, we spent a lot of time with that. That's all right. That's okay. I, I think this was, th this is such an important thing, though, to see the difference between how they lived and how, how we do today. Yes? you think that maybe one of the reasons they didn't, traditional uh, music at the synagogues was that the instruments were uh, allocated to a specific Levite uh, family group you know, that were in the that's exactly the reason why they did not. The Levites were the ones who were assigned to do the singing in the temple and to do the instrumentation in the in the temple. Those particular Levite families, and uh, no one else really was given that responsibility. It was like carrying the ark and a bunch of other things. This was for them. And no one else maybe maybe didn't even know how. To right, right. Uh, you have David who was able to play the harp. And, I, you know, people always, after I've talked about instrumental music, someone says, well, Phil, don't you know that David played the harp? And of course I do. Of course I do. And uh, then I say, but David lived a thousand years before Christ. David was not a Christian. And David is not our example for how we should worship as Christians. He was an example of how they worshiped as Jews. Uh, whether or not there were others who in private used instruments or not, that I don't know. I do know that people played instruments in ancient times. Uh, by the time that things came along in some of those statements that are in the early church fathers in the second and third and fourth centuries, what is interesting is one of the reasons uh, that they didn't use instruments of music in the early church, in fact, they were vehemently opposed to it was because that's the way the Jews worship. <laughs> that's how they, that's, that, there's actually a statement like that, or that's how the pagans worship. We want to worship in a way where God made the instrument, and the instrument is our hearts and our lips and our voices. That all comes from God. And so, uh, so there was a, it was probably not until the 1300s that they began using instruments widely. It was Thomas Aquinas in 1250 who said, uh, our church, speaking of the Catholic church, does not use instruments of music uh, to worship with all. And then he talks about lyres and harps and other things. He says that she may not seem to Judaize. Then you have a situation that in the early uh, period of the reformers, Almost all of the Reformation reformers early on rejected the instrument. They said, well, that's, that's, that's not Bible, that's Catholic. They knew the difference. That's something that was added, not something that came from the Bible. So they did that. Uh, the Presbyterian Church voted in the early 1800s to use instruments of music. They had their group that voted for their denomination, and it won by one vote. But there is still to this day groups of Presbyterians who believe in, uh, uh, believe in only a cappella music. And they, they actually have a phrase that they, they say that uh, uh, you shouldn't use instruments of music because that's presumptuous. And it is. Uh, 
One of the best books I have ever read was a Presbyterian who in the early 1800s wrote against that. And that particular book can be found in Foy Wallace's book, uh, Opposing Instruments of Music, which is still one of the finest books ever written on that topic. If you ever get a chance to get a copy of one, it is well worth your time to read. Chapter two has not only the section dealing with, uh, with the Sabbath, but it also deals with the creation of so many things. We should not think that Genesis chapter two is some kind of addition, a second account of creation. Sometimes in Hebrew writing, and you have this in uh, Samuel, you have it in Jeremiah and other places, where you will have a story that comes to a certain point and then it comes back and talks about a specific aspect of that and gives more detail. Uh, you know, it's almost like chasing what we call chasing a rabbit. You know, they go to a certain point and then there's something that's important, something that's vital. And so they kind of back up and talk more about it. This is what you have in chapter two. Now, there are some people who wanted to make it a second occasion, a second way of looking at creation, because it is in chapter two that we are introduced to the Lord. Uh, the word Lord is used in chapter two, but not in chapter one. And because of that, uh, some people think that it was somebody else that did this. If you look about two, verse four, uh, the field had not yet sprouted for the Lord God had not sent rain. Uh, that's the first time we see that word Lord in, in Genesis. Um, how God formed man from the dust of the earth, verse 7, breathing his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living being. Some say a living soul. Uh, the Lord God planted a garden. He caused things to grow. And it talks about the river that flowed out of Eden place where there's much fine gold, many other things, the fruit of the ground uh, that was there, that uh, the fruit of the trees. But of course, he talks about the tree of knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let me mention to you that whenever someone says something to you about the fall and they're eating of that tree, that tree is not the tree of knowledge of evil and evil. That tree is the knowledge of good and evil. After they ate of that tree, they were a mixed bag, but they knew good and they knew evil. Now, knowing evil was wrong, but that didn't mean that they did not know good or could not do something good. And I think this is one of the great problems. And I like to point this out to people who believe in what's called total hereditary depravity, which uh, we'll talk about in, in a little bit when we talk about the fall of man. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they were not to eat of that. A little bit later on, we get down to uh, the situation where man, uh, it was not good. This is the first time the phrase not good is found. It was not good for man to be alone. So, of course, he put man into a sleep. He took from his side a, a rib and, and made the woman. And uh, uh, while he slept, he closed up the flesh, verse 21. He fashioned uh, into a woman uh, the rib which he had taken from the man. He brought her to the man. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman uh, because she was taken out of man. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. They were innocent. They didn't know anything to be ashamed. There was nothing that they had done that was wrong. Now, it's important that he brings this up because when we get into chapter 3, and uh, the, the first thing that uh, they did was hid themselves in the bushes because they were naked. <laughs> well, who told you you were naked? You know, that's an important part of that. But they were not ashamed at this particular point in time and um, those kinds of things that take place. You have the temptation. And I think this temptation is such a, a big, big deal at this particular point in time. Are there questions about chapter two? That, that I've gone pretty fast over that. 
chapter 3, we have temptation. And, of course, we, we find out uh, the serpent is all that is mentioned here, but we find out that uh, that serpent is, of course, Satan. And he's the one who is behind all that. Now, how do we, how do we know that? Well, Jesus made that point uh, in John chapter 6. And he talked about how that Satan uh, was a deceiver and how he deceived uh, the people and how that he was a murderer. And, of course, the death that came from that. Now I'm going to be embarrassed and I'm going to think it's chapter 8 instead of chapter chapter 6. And it is chapter 8, not chapter 6. Oh, uh, okay, it's verse 44 of chapter 8. I could remember the 44, but I couldn't remember the 8. Uh, John. Gospel according to John. And you remember that he's talking about them, and uh, he says to them, this is beginning in about verse 41. Uh, if God, or 42 rather, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and have come from God, for I've not even come on my own initiative. There we go. But he sent, he sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. And then he says, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So there is the passage that really helps us to understand that this was this serpent really uh, had a relationship with uh, Satan. Satan was behind what was there. He was a crafty beast of the field. Uh, we don't know much more about that particular situation and how it appeared at that time than that. Uh, and it, one of the things that I think is so interesting is the way that he interplays with what God had said. And uh, if I think it's on the next page or so that I have a situation uh, where I talk about the contrast between what God had said and how the serpent and uh, Eve began to understand that because the statement was made that they were not to eat of the tree that was in the midst of the garden. This is in verse 16. The Lord God commanded the man saying from any tree of the garden, you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Now, that's the statement of God. But whenever we begin to look over here and we think about this serpent and how he was dealing with things, one of the things that is so important about all this is that you have this twisting of things that first takes place. Now, the first thing that the serpent does is to create doubt. Create doubt. So many problems come from people not listening to God, but creating doubt in what God had to say. And so he says, uh, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? He just asked the question. And the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Now she begins to add a few things that really was not there. But here is the question. The question that brings about doubt. Now he knew why he was asking. And he knew what she would say. It is interesting that she goes even farther than really the commandment. The commandment is you shall not eat it. But she says, and not even touch it. Not even touch it. So here was a situation where uh, there was a little bit of a, an overreach here. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will surely not die. He contradicts Jesus or the Lord, contradicts him. 
first there is the doubt, then there is the contradiction. And then listen how he works this. He says, for God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God knowing good and evil. So he makes it look like something that is so wonderful for them to do. You're going to be like God if you eat from it. Now, how often has somebody who wants to add something that God hasn't added said to us, well, if you don't do this, you'll, you'll be robbing yourself and cheating yourself out of some blessing. Let me tell you what, the progressives always think they have something better than God's way. The devil always thought he had something better than God's way. Well, you don't, you don't understand why. God knows that the day that you eat of this, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, yeah, they would know good and evil, but they wouldn't be like God. They will have offended God. It wasn't something that would make them holy, make them righteous, make them good. It would be something that would ruin the rest of their lives and your life and mine, by the way. So this is the way that people do. They, they want to make things appear. We, we live in a world that has to feel like, in, in a political sense, put a spin on everything. You can't ever just say what things are. You have to put a spin on it. You have to make it look different than it really is. And uh, both of our political parties do the same thing. It's not a matter of one and the other. It's both of them. And, and people in power do that all the time. It's almost like if you're in power, you can't really tell the whole truth. you got to make it look good so people will vote for you again. you got to keep that power. And here was a situation where the serpent, in order to get his way, had to make it look good. And what he tells is actually a lie. He's a liar from the beginning and a murderer. Yeah, he cost them their souls, or at least at that point they had the sin, yes. I was once told this. The teacher, the principal brought the students to, to the teachers. The teacher, and he told them, go in order. You have to go in order. And the two students were like, okay, sure thing, you could do that. And they learned. They're going from one spot to another. They were told not to go to the last teacher until they're already. And only when they are ready. But then a man comes to them, disguised as a teacher, and says, I know you want to learn faster. Why are you waiting here? And the little girl goes, because I was told to. But don't you want to go further? And she was like, yeah, but I was, you know, was like, well, go ahead, just, just say hi. So she goes and says hi. But when she realized that saying hi opened up a door, she took the rest of the steps, and the boy gladly followed. Yeah. Um, when I was a kid, I couldn't understand the concept of Adam and Eve. Couldn't understand the concept of temptation. Why were they tempted to take the, the bite? Why were they tempted to follow forth until somebody told me it that way? Yeah, it, it's that way. That's seduction. That's really what seduction is all about. Of Here is this situation coming along where if I can show you some advantage. Let me tell you, every commercial that you will ever see on TV will give you some reason why you should buy their product and not somebody else's product. And it doesn't matter that there's a whole lot of evidence that show that this product is not really the best there is. It is in their minds. It is almost like we're going to show this one little detail that shows that we're better than something else, and we're going to ignore all of the other evidence. And that's the way it happens in life. And since the days of Madison Avenue back in the 50s and 60s, and they learned that they could hoodwink people through these kind of advertisements, this has become the way that everything is. Everything is an advertisement. And there's so much. You can take the junkiest thing that ever was, uh, the placebo, and you tell people that if you take this pill, it will help you lose weight. You'll be stronger. You won't have a heart problems. Your blood pressure will come down. You'll have an A1C that's perfect. And it doesn't make any difference what the pill is. You can tell people a bunch of stuff, and it's nothing but snake oil. You know, 
little bit of a little bit of alcohol in it with all of these other things and you feel good after you take it and so you'll pay a dollar for it whenever it's not worth 10 cents and that's the kind of thing that we have and what we have with the serpent he's doing this same thing you're going to be like god now notice the three things about the woman and you were asking the question why uh, after he said this uh it, it says that the woman uh, he says, uh, looked on that fruit, and she saw that it was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise. Those three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Now, <clears throat> you know, this toothpaste will make your teeth white. And you'll get all the girls you want. <laughs> if that's all it took to get a girl was white teeth, you know. Uh, that's the kind of thing that was like the good for food, delight to the eyes. Oh, it'll make you wise. See, she bought into what he said. And so you have this situation where she did, so she ate of the fruit. Now, the New Testament makes it clear in 1 Timothy chapter 2 in the last few verses that while Eve was deceived, Adam was not. His sin actually was worse than hers because he knew better, and he did not, uh, he didn't stop her. Yeah, he was complacent. And uh, I wonder, I wonder what kind of a situation took place between Adam and Eve in those days. I wonder if they didn't fuss about it down the road a little bit that they weren't quite as close after that as they were before, you know. Uh, but he listened to his wife and followed her rather than listen to God. He knew what he was doing. He was not deceived. His sin was worse than hers. And it just seems to me that as we look at this particular passage, uh, we see all of this. And, of course, their eyes were open, verse 7, both of them. Uh, were open, they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Uh, they were naked, and they knew it. So they had to do something to cover themselves up. I guess fig leaves worked uh, <laughs> for them. It wasn't enough. God, uh, God did them a little better. Uh, Whenever you have various types of things, uh, here are some of the things that are in the mind of the woman and the, uh, the serpent. There are statements which lessen the graciousness of the freedoms which the Lord has granted. The Lord has robbed you of something really important. You can't use that instrument. Why, the, you know, uh, God said no. Oh, but... If we don't start using instruments, this was the statement that was made in the 1870s. Why, if we don't uh, use the instrument, we'll lose all our young people. We, don't, we won't be like everybody else. And that's still some of the same things they're saying today, but that was what was being said in 1870, and I heard it since the 1980s. We've got to be like every, No, we don't. You know what is interesting? Let me give you a little, well... It's almost time for a break. Let me give you one little statement, and then we'll take a break. The, uh, the church divided between the 60s and the 90s. It was recognized in 1906. In 1906, the disciples of Christ had 85% of the people who had come through the Restoration Movement, they had 85% of them, had close to a million members. Uh, Churches of Christ had 2,640 congregations and 159,000 members in 1906. In 2006, the Churches of Christ grew eight times, more than eight times larger. What happened to the Disciples of Christ? Well, the Disciples of Christ, uh, they got a little bit bigger. They had nearly a million people. By 1960, they had 3 million people. But you see, their way of thinking was, we have to be like everybody else. They began to uh, sprinkle infants for baptism. 
They began to fellowship everybody. They began to be more and more liberal. They wanted to be like the mainline, mainstream uh, churches. And the more that they became like the others, the more people they lost. They had three million. So they were, in 1960, only about three times larger. And we had grown tremendously during that period of time and were eight times larger within a century. However, from 1960 uh, to 2006, in that period of time, they lost more than 60% of their members, even more than that. Today, the disciples of Christ are down to below 500,000, somewhere in the 400,000s. Uh, even though we may have had some struggles ourselves, we haven't lost. They are the biggest losers religiously of any religious group in America. Nobody has lost more than, ha than they have. Nobody, percentage-wise. Now then, we were told that if we don't do what they do, we can't grow. And the progressives among us, from the 80s and 90s to this day will tell us, oh, we've got to do this, we've got to do that, and if we don't make changes, we'll die. Folks, there are some changes that can be made that are no big deal. But the kind of changes they were hollering for were changes of compromise to our doctrine and to our faith. And when you do that, you do not grow. You do not grow. What you end up doing is dying. And uh, they are dying. They have been dying for a long time. They used to have a library in Nashville that was a really tremendous library. They cannot afford it anymore. Now, the independent Christian church uh, has had its own problems too. The ones who are not part of the Disciples of Christ but play instruments, they've had their problems too. But uh, the fact of the matter is, whenever it said we couldn't grow, we grew and stayed, stayed a cappella. They grew a little bit, and then because they began compromising, they began dying. Well, that's a bit of a history lesson over the last 120, 130, 40 years, and it's one that we need to remember, and it's one I like to remind people of before they say, oh, you've got to make this change, or you cannot grow. That's simply not true. That is simply not true. And just because there is some sociologist and that's what they are in the church growth movement. Some sociologists said, oh, this is what attracts people. Well, attracting people is not the same as converting souls to Christ. We're not here to give people couches. We're here to give people crosses. That's what matters. Jesus died for us and has a cross for us, and that's what makes us Christians. Okay, that's enough. I've preached a little bit. So. <laughs> We'll, we'll take up some more. I want to talk about the, the fall during this next hour. Okay. In chapter 3 and verse 4, uh, when the, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, contradictory. It's interesting that uh, uh, he's speaking directly to the woman, but he uses the word you in the plural. Well, there's only two people. So could it be that Adam was there watching what was taking place and keeping his mouth closed? Verse 7 says, I think it's verse 7, 6 or 7 says, that uh, she gave to the uh, uh, Adam who was with her. Yes. Yeah. So what was said there is verse 7 says that the fruit was given to Adam who was there with her. And that, uh, that to me is, is quite an interesting thing that um, he knew better and he still went on and did what was wrong. He knew better. And uh, this is, of course, one of these situations where there are a lot of people who know things that are wrong, but because their friends are doing them, they think they ought to do them too. And uh, peer pressure <laughs> uh, began in the garden. You know, he, he, he loved his wife. He wanted to be close to her. Well, she's going to eat. Well, he's going to eat too. Well, that was a mistake on both of their parts. Um, it should not have been that way. But he, he 
ends up doing this contradicting. Uh, we've talked about a number of things, but you might want to look at that uh, five statements that are made, uh, one which may indicate confusion about exactly what the Lord God commanded. But uh, God did say, well, that, of course, that was a part of what he wanted to do was create confusion and doubt. And then number five was the statements which may lessen the severity of the consequences of disobeying the Lord God's command. Uh, well, you won't die, but you'll, you'll, you'll be wise like God. You'll be like God and no good and evil. So those were the kinds of things that took place. Uh, there is a doctrine that there is what's known as original sin and how death passed on all men because of Adam's sin. And they think, well, because Adam sinned, then whenever a baby is born, that baby, yes, that baby will die. Uh, because as time goes by, all people do sin as they grow, but they're not sinners as babies. Let the little children come to me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 19, 13. So we should not think that little babies are someone who are like they are when they get older. And uh, it was Augustine who listened to a bunch of babies crying. And, oh, he just couldn't stand it because these babies, well, well, if you were wet or hungry, you'd cry too. I mean, that's just the way babies are. It doesn't mean that they've done something wrong. But he took that to mean that because these babies were like that, that they, and that they, that they were selfish. Well, they didn't know any better. These were not, uh, they having done anything, nothing either good or bad, just talking about in, in, in things. And, and there are all kinds of things that relate to this idea of, of where are we with original sin. I do not know of any doctrine that is more destructive, more wrong than the doctrine that little babies are born in sin and that they have uh, these things in them. Now, we'll talk about this at great length in just a little bit. But I did want to say that this is something that uh, people came up with. There were some Jews who held that view. Origen and Augustine were the ones who were first involved with that. But John Calvin uh, adopted it following after Augustine and, and Origen. And uh, he made it where a lot of things took place. Much of Calvin's doctrine is to emphasize the sovereignty of God. But he overstated the situation whenever he made the statement that not only are children born in sin, but they are not even capable of doing anything good. Let me tell you what, I've known people that were just real rascals who could still do something good. Still could do something good to say that people can't do that. And of course, the idea also, if you take that doctrine to its full extent, is here are people who cannot repent and change. I actually heard a preacher who believed in Calvinism say that God is the one who does the repenting for you, that you don't have to repent. God repents for you. And I thought, well, then why did Jesus say, except you repent, you will all likewise perish? Didn't say it once, said it twice. You think he meant it? Yeah, of course he did. Uh, he came preaching repentance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When the 12 went out, they preached repentance. John the Baptist preached repentance. When the 70 went out, the thing that they were preaching was repentance and the kingdom at hand. All of these things really were very, very important to Jesus. And repentance is really at the very basis and heart of that. You look in the Old Testament and the heart of the book of Jeremiah is repentance. From start, the word turn. Uh, on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized. And then he says in chapter 3, the idea of be converted, that is to turn, to repent, is really the, the thing of this. The, the greatest short story that was ever written, uh, ever spoken, would be the story of the prodigal son. Well, what's the point of the prodigal son? Well, the three parables that are there, the three stories there the, about the sheep, about the coin that was lost, the sheep that was lost, and then about the boy, well, the others, they didn't do anything to do that, but the boy caused his own problems. It doesn't say 
much about it, but the whole idea is this boy came home. He repented. He repented. In fact, the word repent is found in there earlier, but it's not there so much. But he was lost and now he's found. He was dead and now he's alive again. Why? Because he came home. And he came home and he confessed his sins. And obviously he repented. But uh, repentance is so much a part of it. It is interesting that many of our preachers today want to talk about grace, 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 and more grace. And we'll hardly talk about repentance. You can read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And while Jesus was full of grace and truth, and yes, he was. You will not find the word grace on the lips of Jesus anywhere in the four gospel accounts. But you'll find repentance there quite frequently. And I think there is an importance in that and in our preaching and teaching. Uh, I've known some brethren among our people that you might go weeks and weeks and weeks before they would say anything about repentance because they don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Let me tell you something. Repentance is very, very important. Repentance is correction. It's putting things back the way that God intended for them to be. And it goes along with the grace of God in the fact that it heals people. If you break a leg, you can take a shot that de deadens the pain, and you can go to the doctor, and he may have to do surgery. And it may be painful to put that leg back in place. But unless he corrects that leg, puts it back the way it's supposed to be, that man will be a cripple for the rest of his life. We may think of uh, grace as something that relieves the pain for a little while. But it's not just relieving the pain. It is also straightening out the problem that caused the pain. Do we want the pain to be relieved? Of course we do. We don't want anybody to suffer. But you know what? If an individual doesn't correct the path that he's going, he'll never stop suffering. <clears throat> And uh, that's what repentance really is all about, is turning back to God. Uh, because of sin, really the whole creation is cursed because of it. Romans chapter 8 talks a little bit about this. Others talk about, other passages talk about how the whole world, the whole creation grown. The thorns and the thistles came because of sin. Uh, Adam and Eve sinned by eating, but they would suffer in order to eat. It raises bread by the sweat of his brow. She manipulated her husband, but she would be mastered by her husband. The serpent destroyed the human race, and now he will be destroyed by the seed of the woman. Uh, the Lord God then drove Adam and Eve out of the garden into the world where they would be subject to sickness, pain, and eventual death. From obedience, they fell into disobedience. From innocence, they fell to knowledge of good and evil, whereas before they were innocent. From happiness and peace, they fell to sorrow and pain. From effortless enjoyment of the fruits of the garden, they fell to eating what they couldn't uh, produce from the ground by their own work and sweat. From life, they fell to death and all the consequences of falling from God's grace. That's the, the horrible nature of that event. And uh, I can't think of anything that has affected your life and mine more than that fall. But I want us to talk about the nature of man uh, man has an inward spiritual nature that follows the law of his mind, which delights in the law of God, which of itself by nature can decide in moral matters what is right. But man also has an outward fleshly nature, which does not submit to the law of God. It should not be expected that any moral goodness could dwell in sync with a mindset, a way of thinking. We're not talking about all flesh is bad. We're talking about a mindset that comes from this weakness of the flesh. Uh, 
left to itself by nature, the flesh will seek self-indulgence. You know, it's going to seek after the lust of its own flesh. Ephesians 2 verse 3. But the fleshly part of man at birth is not sinful in itself. It is not immoral, but amoral. It does not know what morals are. Given the lead, its direction is immorality, but it was not made impregnated with sin. All that God made was very good. Jesus became flesh. Well, just because he became flesh didn't mean he was sinful. This does not mean Jesus became sinful. And while Jesus could be tempted, he lived without sin. A lot of times people will bring up Psalm 51, 5. Uh, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. And uh, they read that passage and they think, oh, that's, that's got to be terrible. Um, that uh, David was a sinner from birth. But it doesn't say he was a sinner from birth. It says in sin did my mother conceive me. That is an environment of sin doesn't mean that he was sinful, but talking about the environment. Now, a good parallel passage to that is in Acts chapter 2, whenever you have all of these apostles up there and they are speaking by the utterance that God gave to them by the Spirit. They were speaking in other languages and other tongues. And you remember the question was, how do we, how do we, uh, how do we hear these men? How do we hear these men who are speaking in these other tongues wherein we were born? I was born in an environment speaking English, and so I speak English. If I had grown up in an environment that spoke German, I'd speak German or French or Spanish or whatever it is, or Chinese. But I was born in an environment that spoke English. Well, uh, I learned English. I learned to speak the language. It was not something that was inborn in me. It was just something that was in my environment. And that's really what Psalm 51 is saying. But let's look at Psalm 22 and verse 9 and 10. David's reliance on God from birth. He says, yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust in you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Well, why, why do we not take David's passage and say, oh, everybody that's ever, a Christian, ever born or born of God? Well, we know that, yes, this was something that David learned from the time he was a baby. His mama was speaking to him about God. He had to learn it. But he grew up and there were times whenever he was selfish. There were times whenever he saw others doing bad things and he did bad things. Let's remember David, though he was a man after God's own heart, could still commit murder and, and, and adultery. So here, here you have a situation where you have in people a mixed bag where they want to do what is right, but they sometimes find themselves doing what is wrong. You remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane Matthew 26 and verse 41, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so you have this thing of, okay, which way are we going to go? Uh, that old movie, you know, where you have an angel on one side and a devil on the other, and each of them are talking to you, is not really so outlandish when you start thinking about how we think within our heads. Uh, our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. Which are we going to follow? And so we have to recognize that it is our sins, our sins, not Adam's, that separate us from God. Uh, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear dull or heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. It's your sins that cause that problem, not Adam's sin. Your sins. Isaiah 5, uh, 59, verses 1 and 2. Uh, our fathers eating sour grapes will not set our teeth on edge. Ezekiel 18, 1 through 4. We, rece we receive the effects of many misdeeds of our fathers, but never the guilt 
of what our fathers did. We were whole and perfect when we were created until sin was found in us. Ezekiel 28, 15. The Lord forms the Spirit in each of us, and He does not start us out as sinners. He starts us in a way that Jesus thought fits us for heaven. Matthew 19, 14, 13 and 14. Romans 5, 12 is not discussing those without the use of their minds, nor those who do not know their right hand from their left, but it's discussing those who have on their, uh, on their own sinned. All have sinned. Well, they don't sin when they're little babies. But see, this is what they wanted to try to, to make it out to be. And it's a terrible, terrible doctrine. Uh, Ecclesiastes 7.29, bottom of the page. Behold, I found only this, that God made men upright, but they have sought out many devices. Uh, we'll see in tomorrow when we look at Genesis 8.21, the Lord smelled the smoothing aroma, that is the sacrifice that Noah gave after the ark had landed and they came out from it. And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. Didn't say he was born that way. Uh, you and I all have a weakness, a weakness of the flesh. And uh, we have an intent sometimes to do the wrong thing, but there's a difference between having an intent and being tempted and having sinned. Uh, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until un unrighteousness was found in you. This was spoken to uh, an individual, I think Lucifer. Romans 7. I think this is perhaps the best passage for us. Look at verse 9. In verse 8 he says, But sin taking opportunity through the commandment produced in me, coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. And then he said, And I once was once alive apart from the law. There was a time when I was a baby, I didn't know the law. I was alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, well, he's not talking about when Moses gave the commandments, but whenever he learned them, when he got old enough to understand, when the commandment came, sin became alive, and I died. I died spiritually. Uh, and this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me, for sin taking opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. I didn't take God seriously enough. I didn't listen to him. I began listening to my flesh. I began listening to what was going on in my own life. And even though I knew the commandment, I did the wrong thing, and it caused death. I think this is probably one of the best passages to explain Babies are born innocent. I've had to bury a few babies in my lifetime. Perhaps some of you have had to do that. I could not take the heartache away from the mama and the daddy and the other family members, but I could assure them that baby is with God. That baby's all right and will never have to worry about being lost. Uh, total hereditary depravity, the doctrine of total hereditary depravity says that every person from birth has a nature that is corrupt, perverse, and sinful throughout. As a result of this inborn corruption, the natural man is totally unable to do anything spiritually good. This spiritual inability means that the sinner is so spiritually bankrupt that he can do nothing pertaining to his salvation. The natural man is enslaved to sin. He's a child of Satan, rebellious toward God, blind to truth, corrupt and unable to save himself or prepare himself for salvation. That is Calvinism. That is the number one thing, and that is a terrible doctrine. Uh, but we've talked about the condition of a person at birth. The Bible says, Romans 7, I was once alive apart from the law. Uh, the children, neither having done anything good or bad, uh, they were blameless. Acts 17, 29, we're the offspring of God. If, if we're the offspring of God, does that make us bad? Yes, ma'am. So, um, 
one thing that a lot of uh, Asians have said is that a child is innocent, even though all it knows is green. All it knows is what? It's green. Yeah. It's innocent, even though it knows only green. Uh, it's because a child can not know anything else until you teach it. So it's up to you to it's up to you as a parent mm -hmm. to show them the right path. Do you have uh, if you've ever had a, a pet who has no moral aspect, uh, they have to eat. Yeah. They have to eat. It's not a moral thing for them to do things that others would do. We think of it as wrong because we don't want them to kill something else that we treasure. Yeah. But at the same time, it's, you know, a, a baby, an, an infant, uh, is, is self-centered. But that's to survive, and it doesn't know any better. It is, it is the mature. Per there are so many things that only maturity can bring about. Patience. Child is impatient. Patience is something that you learn with time. Uh, I can't think of humility as something that you learn with time. Uh, giving to others is something that you learn with time. Love is something that is learned. People talk about, oh, oh I love this. Uh -uh, love is learned, and you have to learn how to love people. There are some people that are easy to love, and there are some people that are hard to love. You have to learn them to learn how to love them. And so uh, these are the kinds of things that people forget and they don't really think about it. But here is a doctrine that's been taught for the last 500 years. And it is ingrained not only in the Calvinists, but also in the Catholics. You know, they don't think that the, Catholic, uh, that the baby goes to hell. They think it goes to uh, limbo or something, you know, purgatory. not purgatory, limbo. Purgatory is where people go to purge them from sins. Uh, limbo is not limbo. I don't know. What, what is that? I think it is limbo. They go to a place that's neither good nor bad, where they're neither punished nor blessed. Uh, that's where a, a baby that has not been baptized goes to. It's a different category. Do, do you call Daniel? It, it is limbo, isn't it? I think that's right. Uh, purgatory is for the individual who is a Christian but has committed sins and the blood of Jesus is not good enough to cleanse them from sin. Now, that's blasphemy as far as I am concerned. That's blasphemy. That the, that the blood of Jesus is not sufficient and capable of forgiving sin. But the Catholic who believes that you have to go to purgatory, really purgatory should... Now, you have to remember that Catholicism is a works-based religion. Calvinism is a knee-jerk reaction, and everything is what God does. Man doesn't do anything. God does it all. Well, I know that we're saved by grace, but there are conditions to that grace and that doesn't mean that we've earned anything. Do you think the man who went and washed in the pool of Siloam earned his eyesight by washing? No, he didn't earn his, his sight. He, but he had to meet that condition before he got it. Do you, you think uh, uh, Naaman, the leper, that when he went down into the water and he dipped himself, baptized himself seven times, earned freedom from leprosy? No but he didn't have clean flesh like a little child until he came up the seventh time. Meeting conditions is not earning something. It is showing faith enough to be obedient. Romans 1 and verse 5 talks about the obedience of faith. When you go to the end of the book of Romans, chapter 16, 26 and 27, it uses that same phrase, the obedience of faith. This is what's known in Hebrew literature as an inclusio. In the beginning of the book, and then that same phrase at the end of the book. And everything in between is affected by that idea of the obedience of faith. 
I hear some people talking about the book of Romans and they think because we're saved by faith that we're saved by faith alone. And they don't realize that obedience is mentioned not only in chapter 1 and also in chapter 16, but also mentioned in chapter 2. It's also mentioned in chapter 6. And it's also mentioned in chapter 10. The obedience to the gospel is found in chapter 10, verse 16. Being obedient to that form of doctrine is found in chapter 6, verse 17. In chapter 2, it talks about people who are lost because they do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. So obedience is very much a part of the book of Romans. And when you hear the word faith or read the word faith in Romans, it is not a faith that just has some mental agreement. It is an obedient faith. And that's why you have that at the beginning and the end of the book. And it's unfortunate that a lot of people who are supposed to be scholars don't read the beginning and the end of the book and don't see how that all fits together. So whenever you're studying the book of Romans, remember that phrase, the obedience of faith. And uh, uh, God is the father of our spirits and various other passages that I've already talked about. I talk about how man alienates himself from God. When the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. Colossians 1, 21, once you were alienated from God. If you were alienated, that meant you were with God to begin with, doesn't it? Yeah. You can't be alienated unless you were once with him. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. sin hardens the heart, Hebrews 3, verses 12 and 13. And it causes a person to get to the point where they do not have faith, where they quit believing. Let me tell you what, when our society and our culture has begun pushing these sinful things, some of them in our public school system, some of them in other things, did the battery, no, there it is. I covered it up when it crossed my mind. But whenever, whenever there is so much in our society that comes from the media, from the public schools, and from other sources that say it's all right to be sinful, and people begin to do that, they will defend their sinfulness to the extent that they will forget uh, God. And God will no longer be the outstanding one in their lives, but rather the sin will take over. And I think we have to be very careful about that and recognize how important it is for us to be what God would have us to be. Whenever you're studying something like Adam and Eve, these are really the things these are really the things that are important about that particular chapter. It is not just what they did. It is how it affected the whole society from that time to the present. And people need to know Genesis 3. They need to know about the fall and uh, the way that God punished Adam and Eve. Adam with the sweat of his brow and having to earn his bread by that. Uh, Eve by her pain in childhood and how she would be, uh, that her situation would be to look toward the, her husband. And then thirdly, about what happened to the serpent, that the serpent would be on the ground and eat the dust of the ground and how the earth was cursed with the thorns and the thistles. All of that took place. They were, of course, cast out of the garden. And there was the angel that had that sword uh, that would not allow them back in the garden. And they were cut off from the tree of life. All of those things were important for us to understand so that whenever we think about Jesus coming into the world and our being able to follow after Jesus and one day to be able to enter into that new Jerusalem, that city that has no foundation on earth but is built by God uh, that's going to be in heaven, streets of gold and gates of pearl, and there's a river that runs through the middle of it, and on both sides of the river is the 
tree of life, which yields its fruit every month. And then in Revelation 22 and verse 2, it says, and its leaves were for the healing of the nations. That is the most intriguing phrase of Revelation 22 to me. What does it mean that the leaves were for the healing of the nations? Now, we'll have an imperishable body that doesn't get sick and can't die. We don't need healing physically when we get to heaven. The healing will be of our spirits. That it will be where we no longer have pain. Well, pain is not only physical, there's also pain that is spiritual, mental. All of us have baggage in our lives of good things and things that are not so good. And uh, we need healing on the inside of our hearts and souls as much as we need a new body. And I can't help but think that this healing that's in those leaves, this is my opinion, is dealing with the inside, not the body. But it's for the healing of the nations. You can imagine all of the people throughout all the world and how there has been so much war and so much hatred. The Middle East is still full of hatred that's lasted for generations. And you know what? There's not a single thing that the United States can do about the hatred between the Muslims and the Jews. It'll always be. And we can't spend enough money to solve that problem. And it's a sad thing. You think about uh, the Chinese. China, the history of China has been war from the beginning to the end. That's all they know uh, is war. Uh, You look at uh, other places. You look at the Native Americans You know, before the white men came to this country, the Indians were fighting with one another. Uh, Africa, uh, the the tribes were fighting with each other. South America, those tribes were fighting with each other. You look at Europe and the history of Europe, and it's nothing but one war after another. The leaves were for the healing of the nations, and I can't help but think, that God, by this tree of life, will help us to truly love one another as all of God's creatures rather than having the kind of hatred that is found on this earth. The greatest hope we have is the hope that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord and what He will be able to do. So uh, to me, the tree of life being there. It's interesting. The tree of life is kind of ignored until you get to the book of revelation. And one of the promises is that people who are overcomers, he who overcomes will be able to eat of the tree of life. That's in chapter two, I think. And uh, then you have it in chapter 22 where that tree of life is there. But uh, uh, those things to me are, are pretty interesting. Um, Man is not, uh, he is not totally depraved, but, and he is capable of good, but weak. You know, Naaman the leper, uh, he got mad when he was told what to do, but he finally wound up doing it. He overcame his own weakness, didn't he? People can. People can overcome sin. Romans 6, verse 17 and 18, one of my favorite passages. He says, though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart. There's that word obedience. To that form of doctrine to which you were committed. And being then made free from sin, you became the slaves of righteousness. Now what that says to me is that people can change. You can become obedient. And you can do it from the heart. And you have to do it from the heart. And you have to do the right thing, that form of doctrine to which you were committed. 
then you become free from sin and slaves of righteousness. That to me is one of the most amazing passages that I, I like to use that in my preaching evangelistically because what it says to people is you can change. Total depravity says God has to come and work a miracle in your life before you can change. You can't change. He has to change you. That is not what the scriptures teach. You know, there are people who did change. The people who killed Jesus Christ were cut to the heart and repented and were baptized. They changed. Saul of Tarsus, the chief of sinners, changed. People can change. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, it talks about all these terrible sins and people who commit those sins will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, verse 11, you were washed, God cleaned you up. You were sanctified, God made you holy. You were justified, God declared that you were innocent. And you did that in the name of Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. People can change. You were like that, but you're not like that now. And I think that's such an important point. Whenever you preach, please don't ever fail to give hope to people. I, I do preach against sin, but I don't like to stay there. I don't ever want to end a sermon that doesn't give hope to people. Uh, Joel Osteen says, people already know they're in sin. Well, they didn't get that from Joel Osteen. And frankly, there are some folks that even among our people that they wouldn't have gotten it from. But what they need is hope. It's whenever people understand how terrible sin is, sins they committed, that they began to see the sweetness, the grandeur, and the glory of God. To one to whom much is forgiven, that's the one that has the love for God, the greatest love for Him. The one who's forgiven little doesn't have as great a love as the one who's been forgiven the much. Yes. There's a question from someone on, online. Uh, why do you suppose that some say that man was cursed in Genesis 3, 12 through 19? I'm sure I understand the context. Well, there is a bit of a curse, and you remember he would not curse the world. They were cursed by having to eat their bread. The man was cursed by having to eat his bread by the sweat of his brow. And of course she was cursed with the pain in childbirth and that her uh, passion would be for her husband. Those two things. And so there is a sense in which, yes, there is a curse that is there. But the curse came from the fact that they were separated from the tree of life and that they would die. They were going to, they began to die that day. Yes, Adam lived 930 years, as was mentioned later on, but he died. He died. And he was separated from that tree of life that would have given him eternal life. And so he could not live beyond that. So there is a sense in which they were cursed, not in the same sense that God, uh, uh, we're not talking about an unpardonable sin, but we are saying that there is a punishment that, that's given. People who sin have to deal with consequences of their sin. Uh, there are an awful lot of people, like the young boy that I know that I buried many years ago, who took drugs from the time he was a teenager. He took drugs. When he got into his mid-30s, his daddy said, well, I didn't even know the boy was alive. I didn't know anything about the boy. And his daddy said, would you go up to the hospital and visit him? And so I went up to the hospital to visit this boy. And I prayed with him and talked to him a little bit. And all he could say, all he could communicate to me with was this. Oh. That's all he could do. That was the sum total of his ability to communicate. He had fried his brains with those drugs he took. There are things that are consequences to our sin, 
And even though we can be forgiven of sin, there may be some other things that don't go away. Yeah. In uh, Genesis 3, it said, God was speaking to the serpent, said, You were cursed. And he said, The ground is cursed. Mm -hmm. But then he gave, didn't say Adam. Eve at that time, of course, but they had the punishments. Right. The, the word, yeah. There is a sense in which uh, there is a bit of a curse in the fact that because of Adam, because he sinned, sin, uh, and all people sinned, that death passed upon all of us because we sinned. Now, he's not talking about babies and people who are uh, unable to, to reason, but he is talking about all people do sin. Uh, all, all, all fall. You know, that, that is a, a bit of a curse. Jesus took the curse of hanging upon a cross so that we would not be cursed. The righteous for the unrighteous. The just for the unjust. Uh, he died so that uh, we might live. There's a sense in which, yes, from the time of Adam, there has been this weight of sin and the effects of sin on man. And if we want to call that a curse, I guess that's okay. Uh, but the idea that somehow or another, uh, it was not like what was done to the serpent, but there was a penalty that not only Adam and Eve had, but every human being since that time has, has had to face. So, yes, Galatians 3. Uh, and Jesus hung on a tree, was, was cursed, and he was cursed so that we could be free. He redeemed us by bearing uh, sin. Okay, we'll stop here, and we'll take up in another uh, few minutes uh, with Genesis chapter 4, and I think we may get into 5. If we don't, that's okay. We'll, I want us to look at the, uh, what happened in Genesis 4, though, with the two brothers. So we'll stop here at this point. The center fell off. Yes. I'm glad we didn't get that on. <laughs> <laughs> that is not recorded. Not recorded. Genesis chapter 4 is where we're going to begin this next class. Uh, there's a lot in this that is that is helpful, and I have a bit of a history with this passage in discussions that I have had with others. Uh, this was one of those passages where, you know, a guy didn't want to say, well, you know, God, when you worship God, God ought to be happy with whatever you offer to him. Well, now that's mighty, <laughs> that's mighty selfish. <laughs> God ought to be happy with whatever you give him. I, ha I heard a guy teach that in class one time, and I thought, you know, uh, I understand people are weak, but they need to be taught the holiness of God. And uh, that's what we were talking about a little bit ago, is that somehow or another, this generation we live in has forgotten the holiness of God, that God is holy. And we, we are human and have many weaknesses and things, but God is light and God is holy. God uh, despises sin. And there are many things that uh, we need to just kind of remind ourselves about with regard to these, these matters of, of how we treat God. And here we have a situation where the attitude of two people is so different. And the lives of these two people are so different. Uh, when I was teaching a class on worship a number of years ago, I had one chapter which talks about unacceptable worship that's found in the Old Testament and the New Testament and how many places where worship is found to be unacceptable. And the idea that somehow or another, you know, we, God ought to be happy with whatever we offer him is, is one that really doesn't understand God. It really doesn't. And uh, uh, I don't think here we have the first instance of worship and first instance of things. There are a lot of things we don't know. We do not know what God asked of Cain and Abel from the standpoint of what they were to offer. But there is more involved than just what they are offering. There's also uh, the person. Now, the man 
Adam had relations with his wife Eve. And she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she says, I've gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. Now, see, she she could say good things, couldn't she? She still she still loved the Lord in some ways, recognized the grace of God. And let's remember, I did not mention this, but you remember that God made for Adam and Eve clothes made out of animal skins. That was provisional. And while he did get them out of the garden, that doesn't mean that he didn't care for them and help them in later times. Where would we be without the Lord and the help of the Lord? Again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought, but he brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. It was not just the offering. It was also the person, both in the case of Abel and the case of Cain. We don't know all of the background of this, but we can see the weakness of Cain. Uh, so it says Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. And then the Lord said to Cain, now the Lord talked with Cain. The Lord was still a part of their lives day in and day out. He said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? You could see it all over his face. If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Isn't it interesting that here is one of the first times where the idea of sin is talked about in, a, in this particular way, that sin is crouching at the door. Of course, Adam and Eve sinned, but here we have this phrase coming out. And he had a choice. You know, sin is a choice. It is not something that we inherit. It's something that we choose to do. You cannot inherit sin. You choose to do sin. You can be in an environment of sin and do what others are doing, but it's your choice to do like they do. And here was a situation where he had chosen to do something that was not a good thing. And whenever he had to deal with it, he became angry. His face had fallen. Sin was crouching at the door. But you must master it. God knew that a man could discipline himself and he could overcome. He could overcome. Now he said this to Cain who did not know anything about the Bible. He said this to Cain who had never understood about the cross. Let's remember that these people are in the very beginning and they don't have near the advantages that we have of having the word of God and having known about the cross and the love of God and what was done for us. But he, uh, he had this situation where he did not do well. Sin was crouching at the door and his desires for you, you must master it. Cain told Abel his brother. Now we don't know what he told him and we don't know if Abel replied at all. And it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Killed him. Uh, you'd have to be mighty angry at somebody to kill them. Did Abel really do anything against Cain? It was Cain who really wounded himself and ruined his own life. You can have two brothers in the same family and one of them will do good and the other one not so good. 
and you can have one that's blessed, another that that has a lot of a lot of struggles in life, and makes terrible mistakes for which he'll pay the rest of his life. Cain never quite got over that decision he made that day. Don't you know he would have said to himself a thousand times, "That was the dumbest thing I ever did. I wished I had never done that." Not because he was less angry with Abel, but because of the problems that he brought upon himself. Someone asked uh, about why do we suffer? There are many reasons why people suffer. But one of the reasons is that we bring an awful lot of suffering upon ourselves by the choices that we make and have to live with. And uh, some of those uh, can last for a lifetime. They bring more trouble than we ever, ever thought they would. Sin has a high price to pay. And when a person sins against God, the accountability is there. And he will pay far more for his sins than ever in thought he would. A man can't sow the flesh and not from the flesh reap corruption. Yes, ma'am. I just, uh, David, I reflect on his life. That sin, he humbled himself and God forgave him. Mm. But for the rest of his life, he paid. Yeah. And he, he lost four children, yes. you know, fourfold to take the life of, of another. And uh, sin is, is bad. It's just bad altogether. And people hurt themselves more than they realize. They think, oh, I can sin and get away with it. That I can sin and do what I want to, and there are no consequences. There are always consequences to sin. You, you can't cheat God. God always knows. God always sees. And you see, and you know. Sometimes people punish themselves. There are a lot of people who make decisions after they've done wrong things to punish themselves for the things that they have done wrong. He killed his brother. Uh, there are two passages in the New Testament that I think are helpful for us in our study of these things. Of course, the passage that's found in the book of Hebrews, early in Hebrews 11, chapter 11, where it talks about the blood of, of uh, Abel and how that he was a righteous man and how his blood still speaks out. Uh, well, I should not have brought this Bible. I should have brought my old one. These pages are too hard to turn. Abel offered to God a better sacrifice. This is verse 4 of Hebrews 11 a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts and through faith. And though he is dead, he still speaks. I quoted that passage uh, in a discussion I was having with some others on Genesis 4. And I was told, oh, you can't quote that passage. That's not in the context of Genesis. And I said, well, you know what? The Hebrew writer was inspired of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit that inspired Moses to write about Genesis and the Holy Spirit who was there to see all that happened is the same Holy Spirit that inspired the Hebrew writer. Yeah, I think I can. And, uh, and uh, you know, and, and of course I asked the question, are you saying to me that Hebrews is not inspired? Well, I got in trouble with the list. You're not supposed to ever question anybody about whether or not they believe the Bible's inspired. And the thing that I said to him is, is he's the one who brought inspiration up, not me. He was the one who brought that up. And he did before I did. And uh, they allowed me to stay on the list for a little while. There's another passage in 1 John chapter 3 that discusses about the need to love our brother and about, uh, uh, about Cain, verse 11, chapter 3, verse 11. For this is the message which you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one, and slew his brother. Uh, and for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. 
So apparently one of the reasons why Cain's offering was not accepted was in part because of the wickedness or the evil that perhaps was in the life of Cain even before this particular point in time. You'll notice that he just offered what he, what he grew, whereas when Abel offered, he offered the, you know, the firstlings of the flock and the fat thereof. He was how he knew to do that. Whether a blood sacrifice was necessary, those are questions we don't know. We just know that Abel offered the best that he had. And Cain just gave something that he had. But his works were evil even before that. And I think it's important to, to realize that aspect of it, that God has always done that. Uh, anyone who studied Isaiah, the first chapter, there is a lengthy section in that first chapter down before you get to verse 16. You know, come now, let us reason together. Uh, once we get to that, before that, you have the wickedness of the people of Israel and how that God would not accept their worship. Uh, Isaiah 5, 23, that God would not accept the melody of your vials. Well, he's not speaking against instrumental music. He's speaking, if you look at that context, of the evil of the people of that time. And so God was not accepting their worship. Malachi, in the first couple of chapters, talks at great length about how that people were cheating and robbing God and how their offerings were not suitable to God and acceptable to God. When someone says, oh, it doesn't matter how we worship, where do you get that from Scripture? You don't get that from Scripture. You get that from people who want to excuse what they're doing. And this is one of the things that I think that this particular chapter is really helpful and, and bringing out. Now let's think about the, the situation that uh, Cain got himself into. The Lord said to Cain, where's, your, where's Abel, your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? A famous phrase. Well, you know, he knew where his brother was, and God knew where his brother was. He said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. You can hide from people. You cannot hide from God. Uh, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Proverbs 15, verse 3. Ugh. Let me recommend something to you if you have Logos or if you have uh, if you want a good book to buy that will be very helpful to you in your study. And that is the, the, the treasury. There is a new one that's come out. The new treasury of scripture knowledge. Treasury of scripture knowledge. It is like a, uh, a scripture reference guide on steroids. We have all kinds of passages that are there. Uh, with my Logos, I have my scriptures that are there, sometimes more than, one, more than one version. But I always have my treasury of scripture knowledge open. Uh, I think you can even get it with eSword. I'm not sure, but I think you probably can. But the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge is probably one of the finest books uh, because wherever you're studying, it will guide you to other passages that deal with the same issue, the same concept, the same thing. It's just a marvelous book, and I use it quite frequently. And uh, there is another passage in Proverbs that talks about God sees. Uh, Psalm 50 talks about how the people thought they could sin and get away with it and that it was because God didn't speak to them and t punish them immediately that they were going to be okay. And God says to the people, you thought I was just like you. Well, he wasn't just like you. He was different. You know, God was God. But because he was patient, they thought that God didn't care. God does care. Sin does matter. And I think one of the things that we have to, to help people to see is the cross didn't take place because God looked at sin as trivial. Jesus didn't die on the cross for trivialities. He died because sin was a real threat to our souls. And I think sometimes we have to remind people of, of that. Now he says, now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. 
When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You'll be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground and from your face. Uh, I will be hidden and I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. Now, it's interesting that he says this, whoever finds me will kill me. You know, we think here's the number three person to be uh, on the earth. And he talks about whoever will find me. He kills number four, whoever finds me. Well, the fact is that there would be other children born and there would be other people on the earth as time went by. But because he had done wrong, they think maybe they can kill him. So the Lord said to him, therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. Uh, God protected him there. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain. Now what the sign was, who knows? So that no one finding him would slay him. Let's remember that these individuals lived for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. And so this was not such a, an unusual statement that someone would find him. We don't know whether this was at the beginning of their lives, you know, because the story tells it real early. We think maybe they were real young. Well, we don't know how they were or how young they were. We don't know what point in time in their lives this was, but apparently there were other people on the earth uh, whenever this took place. So Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain had relations with his wife and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city Enoch after the name of his son. Now to Enoch was born Irad, and Irad became the father of Mahujael, and Mahujael became the father of Methushael, and Methushael became the father of Lamech, and Lamech took to himself two wives. Now here was the first example of somebody with two wives. And um, the name of one was Adah, and the other was named Zillah. And uh, Adah gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. And his brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all who played the lyre and the, the pipe. As for Zillah, she also gave birth to Tubal Cain, the forger of all implements of bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Naama, Naama. I don't know how to pronounce that, to be honest with you. And Lamech said to his wives, Adah and Zillah, listen to my voice. You wives of Lamech, give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. Now, was he a boy or was he a man? Well, it's hard to know. He was a young guy. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Now, here was a rather arrogant fellow. Do you see what the child of Cain came to be? When Cain got away from God, you go one generation, two generations, three generations, and it gets worse. And this is really important to see what's taking place here because when we get over into chapter 6, we began to see how terrible, what a terrible shape the world has come to be. Yes. The wife of Cain, I know that was the head of his sister. Yes. In verse 25, Adam lay with his wife again, and she gave birth to Seth. The third, I always thought Seth was the third child. Is this in chronological order? No. And I'm glad you brought that up because the next thing I was going to say to you, you remember I told you about chapter two, how that you go through a whole lengthy thing on chapter one, and then you go back and he talks about more information in chapter two. But he's talking about both Adam and Eve were both created on the seventh day, sixth day. Then we have the seventh day. And then it tells about the creation, uh, about what took place with Adam and Eve and the naming of the animals and all of that stuff and uh, the tree, and all of that. So he goes back. Well, here is another instance where he has come down to see, show what 
Cain's descendants were like. And now he goes back, and the reason Seth is mentioned here is because, okay, they lost a child, and Cain has become that kind of person, so here is another child. And the promise would come through Seth. So this is a little bit of the reason. So what we have, and this is very frequent. If you study the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is not in chronological order. If you study the book of 1 Samuel, there are times where you have things about David that is told about him, and then it goes back and tells something more. It has him playing the, the harp for Saul in chapter 16, and he kills uh, Goliath in chapter 17. Well, actually, uh, it goes back and tells a little bit of the story before something took place. So this is, this is the way a lot of Hebrew scripture is. It's like what I was talking about, the chasing of a rabbit, where you tell a story, and then you got to go back and fill in some of the important scenes that you hadn't told in the story to begin with. And this is what's taking place now here about the birth of, of Seth. But it's important that Seth is mentioned here uh, but he wants to tell about Cain first. And then he goes back and tells about I suspect Seth had children that would have been contemporary with uh, Cain and some of his kids. You know. Uh, but Adam had relations with his wife again. She gave birth to a son and named him Seth, for she said, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth, to him also a son was born, and they call his name Enosh. And it says, then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, from this statement, you begin to see the difference between the evil of Cain's descendants and the descendants of Seth. It was at that time men began to call upon the name of the Lord. They prayed. They prayed. They had a relationship with God in prayer and call upon His name. And I think it's very, very important to see the difference between the two. When we get to chapter 6 and we talk about the sons of God marrying the daughters of men, this is what we're talking about here. The difference between the children of Seth and the children of, of Cain. The good and the bad. Now that doesn't mean that Cain did not have some children that were okay. We just It just doesn't say that. Yes? To Enoch's son, you know, to call him employed. It's this we end up with that call God, using the name of God. I know that early they did not even refer to God by name, but Gail, Helion, Yahweh. This would have been situations where people wanted to be close to God. And we're going to find in that lineage in this next chapter about Enoch and how Enoch was so close to God that he was not, that God took him. And that kind of thing. But this sets the stage for what's in chapter 5. Going back to, you know, not, not being chronological, if you try to put it chronological, you get confused going back to the sons of Cain, the sons of Seth, Seth, so forth. It just really get confusing. Yeah. It does get confusing. Yes, ma'am. So are you pretty much telling me that these are just pretty much like how in movies they have flashbacks? You know, there's a sense in which that's taking place where in the story, you've seen lots of movies that have this same kind of thing where they're telling a story, and then all of a sudden in the middle of the story, this person uh, takes place. What happened to them when they were young? You're not ready to tell that part of the story until you get there, and then you go back and you see what happened, and then that explains why the person is the way they are. And that's probably the situation that we have here, the same kind of thing. It's, we're not ready to talk about Seth yet. We need to talk about Cain for a while and the kind of kids that Cain produced and how Cain was away from God. But all of a sudden you have Seth. And you know what? I can't help but think that Adam and Eve probably at that point in their lives had matured some. And uh, they wanted to have a son that really knew about God and the good things. Now, they didn't, you know, they didn't have the wonderful history and heritage that we have, but they, I haven't talked with God face to face or directly 
I'm not face to face in in that sense, but in a, up in heaven. But but with God when He appeared, I haven't had a conversation with Him, but they had, and even Cain had one. But it didn't matter. Cain chose sin, and uh, now you have Seth, and people began to call upon the name of the Lord. You have individuals later on in the book of Genesis, like Melchizedek, and in Exodus you have. Uh, uh, you have the father-in-law of, of Moses. Yes, who is he has two or three different names, Rule and, and uh, what is it? Two or three different names, uh, Rule, and I forget the others. But the father-in-law of, of uh, who was was a, like a priest. Uh, so there were people who did stay close to God even outside of Israel. They were not part of the covenant and the promise but they were men who called upon the name of the Lord. And I think uh, they were under that patriarchal period of time. Now he says, this is the book of the generations of Adam in the day when God created man. He made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female. Isn't that interesting? And he blessed them and named them uh, man in the day in which they were created. Uh, but it's interesting here you have this same thing that is, it is there. But when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. So you have a reaffirmation of what's found in chapter 1, verses 26, 7, in that, that period. That's my trouble with God was gender neutral. It's all this right here. I just think that God was both male and female. God was not physical, but every reference that we have to God as far as pronouns and other things are always in the masculine. And Jesus was male. Uh, I read some, in one of my things that I got today where there was this priest over in England who thought that when Jesus washed feet of the apostles that he was acting like a transgender person. He became transgendered whenever he washed the and I thought, this is how perverted the mind gets when people want to accept sin. That, that's just about as perverted as I, anything I've ever heard of. Um, well, yes, that, uh, there have been a lot of, I've had a lot of men that I have known in my lifetime that I loved dearly. But I didn't have sex with him. <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay, that's enough. <laughs> and just because David and Jonathan loved each other doesn't mean they had sex. You know, uh, David had a lot of wives. He might have. He kind of messed up the other way, I think. But uh, with with. Uh, well, that's enough. Anyway, you, you have this situation where he's created in the likeness of God. And when Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. So he's 130 years old before Seth is born. That's a, a long time. Then the days of Adam, after he became the father of Seth, were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Uh, so... What happened with Cain and Abel probably happened much later in his life. Not, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, 20 years after they were born. It was probably much, much later than that. So all the days of that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Now we're going to see that, that kind of a thing. It's interesting how much the dates come into play. Seth lived 105 years and became the father of Enosh. Then Seth lived 807 years and he became the father of, uh, of Enosh. After he became the father of Enosh, he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. Well, Enosh is there. Then Kenan lived 70 years, became the father of Mahalel, Lalel. And he lived 910 years, and Mahalel lived 90, uh, 895 years, and he died. Jared lived 
962 years, the second oldest, and he died. Enoch, he had uh, Enoch. My father used to have this funny little riddle. Uh, the oldest man that ever lived died before his daddy did. Well, Enoch was the father of uh, Methuselah. Methuselah died the year of the ark. But we do not know that he died in the flood, just that he died that year. Enoch lived 65 years, became the father of Methuselah. Then Enoch walked with God 300 years. Now let's remember they were calling on the name of the Lord. He walked with God. Now let me tell you what, walking with God and God being with you are two of the most important phrases of the Bible. He walked with God for that 300 years. And uh, after he became the father of Methuselah and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. And that's all we know. Uh, Hebrews 11 talks about Enoch as well. Uh, how that he was taken by God. And uh, other than these things, there is a book that some people call the book of Enoch. But this was not written by Enoch. It was written in that intertestamental period. In a pseudo, what's called pseudepigrapha. But some people, uh, it's interesting that the Mormons take some of the things that are in the book of Enoch and put it in the, in the Bible. By faith, verse 5, Hebrews 11, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up, for he obtained the witness before his being taken up that he was pleasing to God. Now that's what all of us should strive to do, is to be pleasing to God. I do have a program that I will do sometime in March on search called pleasing God. I have heard people say, oh, we don't have to please God. I have heard people say that, that pleasing God was somehow something negative. And I thought, read you. and I was told to read the Bible by the guy who said it. And I thought, no, you're the one that needs to read the Bible. Enoch was pleasing to God. Verse 2 talks about how that they acted by faith. And how that by faith, acting by faith, they gained approval with God. That's in Hebrews 11, verse 2. And that whole chapter was really talking about these faithful people who were pleasing to God and gained approval from God. And that's what we should all try to do, is be like Abel and be like any who did gain the approval of God. But here were two men who, uh, who did... Uh, who did do this and did well, and God blessed them. Go down a little bit farther. I'm going to move ahead because we're just about to run out of time. Uh, you have Methuselah, and after Methuselah, you have Lamech, another Lamech. And uh, he was the father of a son, verse 28. Now he called his name Noah, saying, this one will give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. Isn't that an interesting prophecy of Noah and the hope that is found there? Lamech lived 595 years after, became, became the father of Noah, and he had other sons and daughters, so all the days of Lamech were 777 years. You notice how people are beginning to not live quite so long. Noah was 500 years old, and Noah became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But it was that promise in Noah and in his, really in his birth and what his father said about him and how that really came to be true, how that he did bless, bless people with his life and give them rest. And one of the things that God says that we'll look at in the morning, tomorrow morning, sometime is about how God would never curse the ground again after Noah. God would never curse the ground again. 
Okay. I know it's 10 till, but I, my feet and legs are tired and I think it's time to quit. So uh, we'll stop here at this point. Appreciate your attention and all of that. And I appreciate those online and the questions. Uh, we'll begin looking at the flood tomorrow and some things related to that. Uh, we'll be watching a video uh, of some things done by a fellow named Branyan. I've never heard of anybody named Branyan, but this fellow's name is Branyan May. Uh, he lives in Texas. He is one of the directors of the World Video Bible School. He is, uh, has a PhD in astrophysics. He knows a great deal about the stars and things like that. Uh, but he's dealing with this, and the work that he did in this video is just outstanding. And I think it will be something that will be worthwhile for us to take a little time with. The questions that I will give to you that are part of the credit for this class uh, will be taken from the written form that's in the book. All of the questions will be answered by something in the book. I, this is kind of extra, but I thought what he did was so well done that I thought it would be a real good presentation. And it kept what I wanted to do with this course, this particular 12 hours. And that was not only talk about a lot of different things, but also be apologetic. And uh, he deals with, did the flood really happen? And his answer, of course, is yes, it really did happen. And some of the things that relate to it from Scripture. So I think you'll find uh, what he has to be quite, quite valuable. Uh, Branyan May and World Video Bible School. And uh, I called him the other day when I saw this video. I had had this video for years and had never watched it. And I happened to open up a drawer that I had, and there it was. And so I watched it, and I thought, well, Phil... You should have seen this a long time ago. It was really good material, and I think you'll enjoy it. So we'll deal with that tomorrow. And we'll end with prayer. Brother Louie, would you lead us in prayer, please?